guest in the studio with me, criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Noah Pines, and standing by remotely, law enforcement expert Sonny Slaughter. Good morning to you both. Noah, you just heard me talking about how when it comes time for the cross today of Mr. Ammunition Supplier Seth Kenny, this is going to be a big moment for the defense. Um, talk to me how this might be executed, the big points you think they ought to make, please. Well, clearly they want to find out what ammunition was provided. Was a live round provided to Hannah Gutierrez, who, by the way, best transformation I have ever seen for a trial. Whoever changed her look and softened her up, great job. Mm -hmm. she, she's it's perfect. Yes. Um, but I would also, if I was Al Baldwin's lawyer, I'd be watching that testimony, no, 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 this can't happen on a movie set, is really the best evidence for Alec Baldwin to, you know, in his future trial to say, this should never happen. Of course he didn't know. It, it doesn't happen. Right. No, no, Noah, thank you. Good points there. Um, let's look at a clip. And Sonny, I'd like to come to you on the other side of this, please. This is from that Sarah Zachary, the prop master, who uh, I was ripping a bit in my opening statement. This lady who clearly doesn't know how to handle firearms took the stand and, and then she calls up Seth Kenny. See, all, everybody knew each other. They're all friends. They're all working in the industry. And after Joel Souza and Helena Hutchins are shot, Sarah Zachary calls up Seth Kenny. And then she starts dumping rounds into the garbage. Let's watch. Previously, before that, instead of emergency? After the incident, yes. And then you, you all talked. Do you recall anything from that phone call? Again, not telling us what Mr. Kenny said, but do you recall anything from that phone call? Yes. What do you recall? Just him mortified. Oh boy. Okay, Sonny, uh, let me get your thoughts, please, on this lady who's handling guns, uh, isn't charged after she admittedly tampers with evidence, and the state makes her a witness. Your thoughts, please. I'm concerned about that. I believe that everyone should have been thoroughly investigated, charged. This is, um, she's tampering with evidence. Clearly, she sees that something is wrong. So why hasn't she been charged? What makes her a better witness than what everyone else has seen? I'm not sure why they did this, this entire set and the recklessness and the careless behavior of others and the cover-up that started from the very onset is concerning. And it should concern all of us. I know they have to make the case, give someone the opportunity to, you know, support their evidence, but if they have the evidence, they should not make all of these deals. Right, right, Sonny, I'm with you. Uh, I liked how our friend Dutch Merrick put it. Uh, he's an expert. Uh, on movie sets. He's an, a firearms expert, an armor, a prop master, well-known guy in Hollywood, and he called it a cascade of failures. That's what we saw on the Russ set. I couldn't agree with him more. Uh, to your point, Sonny, about that, I've got a clip from the medic, uh, Sherilyn Schaefer, the medic who talks about uh, how she saw the casual attitude going on with Hannah Gutierrez in the handling of the guns. A lot of times um, when I would notice, I would notice our armorer um, hand the guns over to the actors, sometimes checking them, sometimes not. Um, it, generally, once the scene is over, you would remove the weapon. Um, the armorer would remove the weapon from the actor and re-secure it until it is needed again. Uh, on Rust, that did not happen um, a good majority of the time. The actor still remained. Uh, in possession of the weapon, whether it was in their holster or in their hands. Mm. So, no, as you know, we haven't heard a lot of great things about Hannah Gutierrez and the way in which uh, she took her job duties. Um, it seems that she had kind of a casual attitude. It seems that there were times where she left firearms unattended, uh, things like that. Um, talk to me about the defense case. How do you view it here? You know, as somebody who's been a prosecutor, now you do defense work in the private sector. Do you think they have a shot here at prevailing in this case? Bad pun, right? Uh, I, not with Hannah. I mean, it's ultimately her responsibility. She, regardless of people supervising her, her job is to make sure that that gun is safe to be used on a movie, and if she didn't do it, then she's criminally negligent, which is what she's charged with. Right, I appreciate it, Noah. Noah Pine, Sonny Slaughter, I'm so glad you both are here. Stand by, please. Gotta hit a break. Here's what we have, though, coming up next.
Our detectives have determined that Madeline was never dropped off on the morning of February 26th near her school. Instead, we believe she was already dead at the time and that Stephen Stearns moved her body. The remains of 13-year-old Madeline Soto found and her mother's boyfriend is in custody. We're wondering this morning, what might her autopsy reveal? And Tupac Shakur's music producer is joining us live on the show this morning to talk about Tupac's tragic murder and what justice should look like. I'm the armor, or at least I was. A famous actor in a movie set accident that ended in tragedy. I turn and come because the gun goes off. Now, Alec Baldwin and the film's armorer have both been charged with involuntary manslaughter. Just because it's an accident doesn't mean that it's not criminal. Court TV takes you inside the courtroom as Hannah Gutierrez faces a jury. The Baldwin movie shooting trial. Live coverage today, only on Court TV. Now for what's trending in true crime, the body of a missing Florida teenager has been located and police are pointing to her mother's boyfriend as the main suspect. 13-year-old Madeline Soto was last seen alive in late February as she was preparing for just another day of school, but she never made it to class. Police have arrested her mother's boyfriend, 37-year-old Stephen Stearns, on charges of sexual battery and possession of sexual abuse material. Now, Stearns was the last person to see Madeline on February 26, when he was supposed to be dropping her off at her school. Our detectives have determined that Madeline was never dropped off on the morning of February 26 near her school. Instead, we believe she was already dead at the time and that Stephen Stearns moved her body in the early morning hours on that day. Detectives later recovered Madeline's backpack and her school-issued laptop from that dumpster. At 819, we have evidence that shows Stephen Stearns returning to the complex and Madeline was visible in that vehicle. We believe she was already dead at that time. Mm, this is so disgusting, isn't it? Police claim to have some very disturbing images on Stern's cell phone, as well as that key surveillance video. So our question this morning, what do you think the autopsy will reveal about the case? Let's bring in our guest in the studio with me, criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Noah Pines, and standing by remotely, law enforcement expert Sonny Slaughter and retired criminal defense attorney Kirk Nurmi. A uh, big welcome to you all on this. Uh, Kirk, let me start with you, uh, please. Uh, your thoughts on this case, the thoughts on Stephen Stearns, the charges he's currently facing, and what you think we may glean from the autopsy. Well, Starting with the autopsy, Julie, I think it's going to ultimately tell a tragic tale, right? It's going to tell us the manner of death. It might give us an approximation of time. And sadly, the reality is it's going to give us an insight into what Madeline endured prior to her death. I mean, the images that you referenced... Uh, on, on his phone, what have you, those are the charges he's currently being held on now in terms of also in terms of moving the body. I think that's going to help paint a pretty clear picture, a tragic picture of what went on here, a disgusting picture, as you mentioned. And ultimately, it's going to be, and, and that phone data as well, what was he, you know, where was he, what have you. So I think we're going to get a pretty clear picture here that common sense is probably leading us to conclusions uh, that we have right now. I think that's going to be supported by the autopsy. Right, Kirk. I I'm thinking uh, that beautiful child may have been sexually abused, uh, child sex abuse material on his phone, according to police. He was the last one in contact with her. Uh, I, you know, I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. Uh, but that seems to be where um, police are hinting with what they've revealed so far. Uh, Sunny, to you next, please. Your thoughts? If um, the police are saying child sexual abuse material and it includes 
Madeline, then I'm also going to ask the question, what happened to trigger the actual murder? Uh, how long has he been the mom's boyfriend? How long has the sexual abuse been going on? And I'm also going to be looking at the autopsy to see if the trigger could have been that Madeline if he was sexually abusing her, was potentially pregnant, and that's what set off this um, criminal activity of alleged murder by him. I'm also going to be wondering if he's ever done this before. And uh, it may have been that they have found a lot of stuff on his phone that sends him down the rabbit hole to other victims that we don't know about. This is horrific. Um, I'm not going to blame Madeline's mother at the moment. We don't have enough evidence for that to determine whether she was uh, complicit. But I am going to say that this is horrible and we have got to stop these type of criminals. They don't have a look, so we should not be looking for a certain look and a type of person. They're predators by nature and this is what they do. I appreciate everything you just said, Sonny. Thank you for all of that. You mentioned the collection of evidence. What else there may be? I've got a clip from the press conference, uh, and I'd like to come to you on the other side of it, Noah. We have video evidence that shows Stephen Stearns discarding items in a dumpster in that apartment complex in Kissimmee at 735 on Monday, February 26. Detectives later recovered Madeline's backpack and her school-issued laptop from that dumpster. Mm, the backpack, the laptop, the dumpster. Uh, Noah, your thoughts on all of this, please. Well, clearly he's trying to hide all the evidence, which he's not very good at because he got caught on video because there's videos all over the place these days. Um, so it's not looking very good for whatever timeline he created, you know, knowing that she was last with him and then he's dumping some of her stuff. Right. Um, this guy's, uh, he's in trouble. He's in big trouble. Uh, yeah, and I, you know, there's, you know, when you think of an autopsy, it's probably strangulation or blunt force trauma and something like this, which would indicate that she was resisting and he then killed her. It, it, it certainly uh, sounds uh, that way. I, I want to know more about this guy. I want to know, uh, like Sonny said, does he have a history? Is there any past criminal history? Any uh, thing that would show he's got a proclivity toward children? Uh, this is just uh, disgusting stuff. Our heart goes out to, uh, to Madeline Soto's loved ones as they grieve her. Uh, and there's another family grieving, as you all know, the family of Lake and Riley. Let's talk about this case. The University of Georgia's campus still reeling. Of course they are. After her brutal murder, she was laid to rest on Friday. The suspect in her case is Jose Ibarra. He's also here illegally from Venezuela, uh, and uh, he's got an ICE detainer on him, so he's not going anywhere. He's facing numerous charges, including malice murder and felony murder in the 22-year-old's death. Now, the day before Riley's funeral, the Georgia legislature passed a bill that empowers police to arrest anyone suspected of entering the country illegally. And this measure would require police to report to the feds when someone is in custody and is here illegally. Now, our question this morning, will we see justice for Lake and Riley? If so, what might that look like? Uh, Noah, I'd like to start with you uh, being licensed to practice in the state of Georgia. I, I know you're aware there's been a special prosecutor assigned to this case. Uh, tapping into your experience as a prosecutor, how do you think this case may play out? Well, if anyone's going to get justice for her, it is the special prosecutor, Sheila Ross. She is top-notch, um, one of the best prosecutors probably in the country. She's handled big time high profile cases in the state of Georgia when she was in the Fulton County District Attorney's Office and now she's part of PAC, which is a statewide agency. She is somebody I respect tremendously and she will do everything she can to get that family justice. She will, she is thorough, like really, really thorough, Julie. No, it sounds like it. She sounds like quite an accomplished woman. I know you would know uh, of her, her reputation, all of that. And uh, so the case is in good hands, without a doubt. And I think one of the big questions is whether capital punishment will be pursued. Uh, let me turn to our other guest now. Uh, Sunny, I'd like to go to you on this point, please. Do you think we will see uh, the state pursue the death penalty on this one? 
Absolutely. Georgia does it, um, you know, like New York, they're one of the best at getting things done. I concur with Attorney Pines. Sheila Ross is a stellar um, uh, special prosecutor, prosecutor and attorney. So I do believe that they will pursue the death penalty. This was so heinous in nature and so unexpected. I cannot imagine that Georgia will ever let him go for any reason. So I think we're going to see this case wrapped up. The family will get justice and we will need to come up with other measures on how to address, you know, how he got in contact with her. Was he pursuing her at some other point in time and she just did not know or was this a crime of opportunity? Mm -hmm. Appreciate it, Sonny. Uh, Kirk, to you next, please. And, uh, and you have the unique experience of doing capital cases, and you, of course, do not believe in the death penalty. You and I have had spirited you know, debates uh, on the show, and I, you know, I respect you tremendously. I always say you saved Jody Arias's life, one of the most famous cases of our time. She's alive today because of your great advocacy work. Um, so taking the other side for us, just for the sake of our, our dialogue here with Jose Ibarra, um, what are the reasons uh, not to pursue the death penalty for him, Kirk? Well, you know, that that's a, such a broad question, right? Obviously, I, as you said, Julie, you know, I, I'm against the death penalty. I respect your position as well. But, you know, one of the things that if the death penalty is being pursued, somebody is doing as a death penalty lawyer is collecting as much information on the client as possible. They want to know their background. They're wanting to know, want to know everything. Get a psychological evaluation. Because, you know, Julie, there's two ways to save a capital defendant's life in a, in a death penalty. One is at the trial level and the other is at the appellate level. So you're going to want to start building that case, making those motions that might result in the any sentence that is imposed, any death sentence that is imposed being overturned 10 or 15 years down the road. So those are the things that you're looking at, collecting all that mitigation information. You're looking at challenging the evidence. You know, you're going to have two attorneys, you're going to build a team, and you're going to be going at it right away no holds barred, everything you can to save that person's life because that's your charge as a capital defense attorney. Whether you like that person or sure. not, or whether you believe they're innocent or not, that's your job. Right. Ooh, so well said, uh, Kirk. And this is important to understand. I, I always say, you know, uh, defense attorneys have such a tough job, an important job that our Constitution requires. I always say, don't get mad at the defense attorneys. If you want to get mad at their client, go ahead, but don't get mad at them. Uh, they have they have a, a very tough job, and it's a noble one. We've got to leave it there for now, but great discussion as always. Kirk Nermy, we've got to say goodbye and thank you to you. We'll see you soon. Sonny and Noah are going to stay with us. want you to do the same. We've got a great interview review coming up next. Tupac Shakur is a music legend and for a long time this community and worldwide have been wanting justice for Tupac. Today we are taking